that a cop recruited by the brass while still at the police academy to inform on dishonest cops would be treated by the brass as a hero if he accomplished the mission they sent him on. But that's not what happened to one New York City cop who took his job seriously enough to turn in fellow officers who were caught up in the drug trade. No matter what they tell you at the academy, no matter how much you represent the badge they pin on you, there is still something called the blue wall of silence. And if you rat on a fellow officer, you're the marked man. Every New York cop knows what happened to Officer Frank Serpico 20 years ago when he went public with his charges and ended up abandoned and shot in a drug raid. Convinced that his fellow officers had not backed him up, Serpico left the force and left the country. So when the latest cop decided to come forward before the Mullen Commission created to investigate police corruption in New York City, this is the way he did it. In silhouette, on videotape, anonymous, known only as Officer Otto. I know of police officers stealing money from drug dealers, police officers stealing drugs from drug dealers, police officers selling stolen drugs back to drug dealers. The testimony from this Officer Otto triggered the largest police scandal in decades. 30 officers arrested on charges of drug dealing, robbery, and extortion. They don't have any fears at all. His real name was never supposed to surface, but when he became the target of accusations he felt were unjust, he agreed to come out of the shadows to tell his story. His real name is Officer Barry Brown. How did you feel when, when you saw all of those cops you had worked with arrested being let off in handcuffs? It was a strange feeling that night. I knew it was the right thing, what I, had, what I did, but I still had mixed feelings. And I remember that night watching the news and seeing guys that I knew for years, guys that I used to go out and have drinks with. Some of these guys saved my life on a couple of occasions. And here they were being let off in handcuffs, and a part because of what I did. Here was a guy who stepped outside the so-called blue wall and said, it doesn't exist to me. Veteran crime reporter John Miller just stepped down after serving a tour as New York City's deputy police commissioner. The last big name in police corruption, uncovering police corruption in New York, is Frank Serpico. How would you compare Barry Brown and Frank Serpico? I have a lot of respect for Frank Serpico and what he did, but he's no Barry Brown. Uh, Frank Serpico complained and complained and complained that the system was ignoring the corruption, but he never actually fingered anybody himself. Barry Brown said, no, I'll tell you exactly who's doing what. I'll go undercover. I'll be dropped behind enemy lines, and I will operate here as a spy, and I will pass on what I know about all crooked cops, and I'll have no compunction about doing it if they're breaking the law. And he certainly took a, a larger step there than Serpico did. And he took that step knowing that only trouble comes to those who turn in their fellow officers. I don't have any second thoughts. I don't regret anything that I did. But you say you have some concerns for your own safety, for your own life. I'm fearful of reprisals, yes. From? From officers that were arrested in the 30th Precinct and from other officers who were very upset that I broke the blue wall of silence, that I spoke out about what was happening. This is the police station where Officer Brown reported every day, New York's 30th Precinct in West Harlem. <laughs> A neighborhood many consider to be the center of the most active drug dealing in the country. You see down there on that corner there, 150th Street, in that block they sell drugs all day. Right around the corner from, around the, the, corner. from the police station? Yes, and they know it. So, I mean, you're telling me that, that drug dealing takes place within walking distance of the precinct? Yes. That's what I'm telling you right in the eye of the precinct. In other words, you can't miss it if you try. Ray Charles could, I'm sorry, but Ray Charles could see it. And he's blind? Yeah. It was called the Wild West? The Wild Kingdom was one of the nicknames for the precinct. So the stories about drugs there, I mean, I've had people say it was on every corner, not just one person on a corner, but it was like a supermarket out there. That's not exaggerated? That's very true. The 30th Precinct was an open-air narcotics supermarket. You could buy anything you want from a $3 vial of crack to kilos of cocaine. 
And what Brown would quickly learn is what most of the people in the precinct seem to know already, that the cops were part of the problem. And oh, do you oh, know that a eat. lot of cops are known just like drug dealers in the streets? Yeah, right. They are known, like certain ones, they laugh and talk with you. Everybody yeah. know them around the, the hood. And like know them how? Know that they crooked, but they know that they... So they if, you saw, if you saw drug dealing going on and you wanted to do something about it, it's would you call the police around the Why corner? should I call the police? The police are the friends of the drug dealers. The police ain't gonna do anything yeah. because they're friends. It was just unbelievable to see the things that were going on up there. I mean, it was a slow What was going on up there, he says, were dozens of cops feeding off the drug trade. Well, it got so crazy at one point, the officer who was close to me approached me one day and asked me if I wanted to get involved. He told me that they were stealing kilos of cocaine and selling them back to the drug dealers for $10,000 a key. Even his partner, George Nova, whom he had grown up with, was involved. My partner was taking payoffs from drug dealers in the precinct. He asked me on one occasion if I wanted to hit a drug spot with him. He told me about a location where there was supposed to be $40,000, two kilos, and a couple guns. And he asked me if I wanted to hit that location with him. And I told him no. A couple days later, he asked me about it again. And I told him no. For Reverend Frederick Williams, the neighborhood minister who baptized Brown, it's not surprising that Officer Brown played it straight. If you knew his parents and grandparents, you could understand that. <laughs> he, he did say it came from his father. Yeah, yeah that's, as I said, it's the whole family matrix. Well, when I joined the police force, my father came to me. He's a very big man. He's six foot four, 300 pounds. And he came to me and he looked me in the eye and he said, you're going to see a lot of things out there in the street and there's going to be a lot of temptations. And if you don't stay away from it, you're going to have to answer to me. And I took those words to heart. Did you know about this so-called blue wall of silence? I've heard about it throughout the years, yes. And did you think that he should observe that or ignore it? Ignore it. Because? Because that's why he's a police officer. He's there to do the right thing. Every cop who graduates from the police academy is told to do the right thing. But for Barry Brown, it was more than a motto. While still a cadet, he was secretly recruited by the commissioner's office to fight police corruption, to break that blue wall of silence. Barry Brown was told, you're going to be one of our special field associates. That means that no one will ever know your identity but your particular handler in internal affairs. Your name will be locked away in a safe, and you just report to us, as our eyes and ears in the field, any corruption you see. And for four years, that's what he did, reporting all the corruption he saw going on in the 30th precinct to his handler at internal affairs. So what happened to all that information? Nothing ever happened. So they ask you to inform in an effort to prevent corruption. You do what they ask and nothing happens? Exactly, nothing happened. <laughs> Nobody told Barry Brown that the game was rigged. You know, that they didn't really want to find these things out because scandal was a career stopper. And uh, it was much, much better for a commander's career to make that stuff go away. Nobody told that to Barry Brown. What impact did that have on you? I was just shocked that here I was risking my life out in the street every day reporting corruption and that they weren't doing anything about it. Eventually, Brown's handler had to acknowledge that the department would probably never act. And for his own safety, he should transfer out. Brown left behind a precinct abandoned to a conspiracy of drug dealers and crooked cops and a police department willing to permit it. The bosses knew. The top knew. I mean, the fire bell was going off loud and clear a long time. And nobody was answering the bell. Detective Frank O'Hara, investigator for the Mullen Commission, which was created to investigate police corruption, says that Brown was the reason they were able to expose the biggest police scandal in decades. But Barry Brown got you in the door. Uh, he kicked the door wide open. And what did you find once he kicked the door open? Whew. Chaos. A precinct out of control. 
And it was Detective O'Hara who persuaded Brown to take the risk of testifying in silhouette as Officer Otto. Raise your right hand. And in making that tape, Brown exposed far more than a bunch of crooked cops. He revealed that officials at the highest levels of the department knew about the corruption, chose not to do anything about it, and even boasted about their anti-corruption efforts. They thought they were one of the best internal affairs units in the United States, in the world. But, but how could they think that if they've got an officer who's telling them what's going on and no one's being not even slapped on the wrist about it? I don't know. I guess they'd have to plead insanity. When the arrests in the 30th finally came, it should have been Barry Brown's moment of triumph. He seemed to be just the kind of cop that the new reform mayor, Rudolph Giuliani, insisted all cops should be. But instead of being honored, Brown discovered the district attorney was about to have him arrested as just another crooked cop in the 30th. I got a call that within 24 hours he was supposed to be locked up as part of the 3-0 case. I said, how can that be? I mean, this was the guy who started the 3 case. Locked up for what? And they said locked up for allegations that Nova was ma making against him. At that point, the question was, well, who could believe Nova? If the accusations against Brown were hard to believe, it's because George Nova, Brown's old partner, only made those accusations after learning that Brown was Officer Otto, and after he had been told that he could hope for a lighter sentence if he fingered other cops. Nova's charge was that Brown had committed perjury about the way he'd gathered evidence in drug cases. Do you feel that you have anything to be ashamed of in your career? I don't have anything to be ashamed of. And what did you think then when you found out that the DA's office might be targeting you? I was shocked that everything that I did for the department, that I was still a subject of a criminal, criminal investigation, was very upsetting. It turns out that the DA, Robert Morgenthau, had no idea that Brown was Officer Otto, the cop who triggered the fall of the 30th. But when Morgenthau was told, he would only agree to postpone the arrest, not to drop the case. Why didn't Morgenthau let Barry Brown off the hook? We're talking about turf wars here, where the last guy in the world who should be targeted is caught in the middle. Miller says Brown may be caught in the middle of a bitter rivalry over who can claim credit for bringing down the 30th, the DA's office or the Mullen Commission. You know, the Mullen Commission made a big splash with the 3-0 case, and uh, some of the district attorney's people felt that the Mullen Commission took too much credit. The DA's office, which declined an on-camera interview, categorically denies any such political motivation. Meanwhile, Barry Brown's life is on hold. One of your colleagues told us that every honest cop is watching to see what happens to Barry Brown. It could be. It could be. And I'm sure the, the naysayers out there are just waiting to say if he gets hurt or if he gets, leaves the job or whatever. See, I told you so. You know, keep your mouth shut. Don't rock the boat. Don't get involved. If you had to do it all over again, knowing what's happening to him now, would you have used your powers of persuasion to, to get... Brown to cooperate so openly? No. You were the first cop in recent years to, to break the, the blue wall of silence. What would you say to the next police officer who feels conscience stricken when he sees corruption and wonders if he should do what you did? I would tell him that it's his duty to do it and that he has to do it that he can't let other officers tarnish the badge. Even though District Attorney Robert Morgenthau declined to be interviewed for this story, he sent a letter cautioning us against presenting Barry Brown as a hero, given the allegations of perjury against him. Meanwhile, Brown is working a desk job, not in the 30th Precinct, and the DA's office says it will decide within weeks whether or not to file formal charges against him.